Hi, I'm Aga Bayer. Hi, I'm Shani Person. Welcome to The Deep Dive, a monthly culture lab podcast where we dive headfirst into a topic that is crucial for building thriving cultures at scale. Join us as we geek out and explore the intricacies of culture, discussing everything from the latest trends to timeless philosophies. With each episode, we take a deep dive into a specific area, offering unique perspectives and insights on how to create and sustain a culture that fosters growth, innovation, and success. Whether you are a business leader, HR professional, or just someone interested in understanding how cultures work, the Culture Labs Deep Dive is the show for you. So sit back, relax, and get ready to take the plunge into the fascinating world of culture with us. And today we're going to talk about going beyond performative gestures and focusing on DI work that makes an impact. I will shortly share the conversation we had with Shani. But first, let me tell you about the Culture Brain community. Culture Brain is a place where culture leaders connect with exceptional peers and where they learn from world class experts. Some of them, by the way, are guests on this show. It's also where they get all the support they need to cultivate a culture where people do their best work. We have a private member platform, toolkits, resources, and an amazing video library. And we make constant additions and improvements based on the question that is at the center of our work. How can we best support the people who work on company culture? If you are curious to learn more, go to tinyurl.com forward slash culture brains. And now with no further ado, here is Shani and I riffing on the topic of the month, DI. Hey, Shani. Hey, Aga. Welcome to the Culture Lab. Thank you. So good to have you here again. Yay. Good to be here. Good to be here for our monthly. And this month, we have a very ambitious topic. And I know that both of us feel quite intimidated by it. I want us to talk about DEI. And I want us to talk about the specific topic of how we can move beyond words into actions and initiatives that can truly have an impact on the workplace. Because I feel like whilst there is a lot of awareness these days around what DI is and why, for example, diversity, equity, and inclusion are important, not just ethical, but also important and positive for the business. I feel like we've hit plateau a little bit and and got stuck in this area of knowing that it's important, maybe also doing some performative gestures to signal that this is something important for our organizations. But when you really kind of look into what's happening in a lot of organizations, you realize that it's quite superficial. So why don't we kick it off with exploring that and what your perspective is around my assertion here? Do you agree with it? Like, what do you see? That we have a lot of performative kind of gestures. I agree. I feel like a lot of the visible debate around this isn't very grounded in continuous actions. There's a lot of putting a pride flag on your company logo for that month. But then there isn't really anything that is done internally to mirror that or International Women's Day or whatever other areas of awareness there might be. I see a lot of the same. I think that they become quite empty. I look at them now and sometimes I go, is that a good idea? Is it potentially very bad employer branding? Yeah, exactly. And. I genuinely, I have the same reaction, like when I see the rainbow flags or whatever appearing suddenly around Pride Month and then disappearing, I immediately, my cynicism kicks in. I'm really skeptical, you know, and I think it's because we have seen so much of that. 
I hope that some of these companies don't limit themselves to that. But I think a lot of people will be probably under this impression. And so I'm wondering, like, sure, you can put that rainbow flag, but what stands in the way, uh, Shani, you think? And why are we still having these systemic inequalities that are not being addressed in organizations? Mm, That's a big question. (laughs) Well, that's what we're all about. That's what we do. A part of it, I think, is human nature. It's hard to change. And especially when there are people or units or ideas that benefit from the current structure. If there is a sentiment that there might be in any way a loss of profit, of efficiency, yeah, anything that stands to benefit the organization. I think what I see is that a lot of organizations, of course, and as they should be, businesses are here to generate money. That's not something strange. But when that becomes the sole purpose and the premise for that is that you have to maintain something as status quo, anything that you know, might in some way move our ability to do something is threatening to that system. And I do think that having worked and interacted with different people in different companies, it is really hard to change that thinking. And for me, a lot of it comes from that kind of business industrial (laughs) machine and the desire to preserve it. This is in no way defending that. (laughs) So just an observation of that, I think, you know, the system itself wants to maintain itself. Oh, yeah, totally. I think that's what's the nature of systems, right? That they are really kind of wired to survive. And I think it's interesting that for some reason, there is this perception that diversity, equity, and inclusion are a threat to the current status quo. And that they might take away something from people or systems that are currently their status quo. And I found it really inspiring and important in the conversation that I had with Minda Hart on this show. It's not about taking something away from people or from organizations. It's about extending that table, right? To create more space for people. So to me, And I think you're hitting the nail on the head. It's human nature. It's also how our systems are reactive to any change in this attempt of self-preservation. And so we really need to reframe, I think, this whole conversation and highlight the fact that people are not going to lose anything, you know, or we're not really trying to destroy the good stuff, but we're just trying to create more for everyone. And what Minda also mentioned in my conversation with her is that actually, and it's, you know, I know that we're preaching to the choir, but not everyone believes that. She said, actually, when you have a diverse, equitable, and inclusive workplace, it makes things better for everyone, not just the groups that are underrepresented. It's better for everyone. Yeah, but it's kind of a finite mindset, right? Like we walk around with the sentiment that if that person gets more, or if this is extended more towards that, I will get less. And actually it's right. It's not like that. <laughs> there is space for everyone. There is love for everyone. Yeah, it's not a limited pie. We can grow this pie. And that's the whole idea, I think, behind diversity, equity, and inclusion that when you extend the table and when you create more seeds, the people who join the table, they're going to contribute to creation of value. I know you have a lot of conversations around this. What do you think that organizations can do then to kind of move beyond whatever is performative, tokenism, all of these things that we know we kind of highlight as as negative within this space? How do you move from that to to real equity and real inclusivity. I think it's interesting because even in the abbreviation, we typically start with a D, with diversity. And I really think that we need to flip the order in a way, not just in the abbreviation, obviously, but most importantly in how we approach this and start with inclusion. 
because I've seen a lot of examples of companies that focus on creating diversity in their workforce through the recruitment process and trying to find representation. And they brought in the so-called, I'm doing air quotes now, our listeners can't see it, the so-called diverse, you know, hires. They brought them in. And then what these people were faced with is a culture that is not embracing diversity. And that's like the worst case scenario, because you suddenly create an environment that I believe is even worse than it was before. There's friction, there's tension, and obviously the people who are being brought in, they quickly realize that basically they were brought in on a lie, promised something that is not that. So long story short, I think that we need to start with uh, inclusion in our workplaces and create an environment where the people who are inside the organization, even the wild white uh, males who uh, typically we, we consider generally uh, to be the most privileged group, even they can feel like they are being included. I know that predominantly they do, but there are certain cases where they might not. And so it's not excluding anyone and making sure that everyone can feel like they are being seen and accepted for who they are. That, for me, is number one. And then you can start thinking about bringing in more diversity. So for me, one of the reasons is companies and people are simply not prepared for diversity and inclusion and equity. So you need to educate. You need to help people identify their unconscious bias and how it shows up in their daily interactions. You need to create systems where people can hold each other accountable and help each other to be more inclusive and more sensitive. And that is typically missing. So we start from a wrong place, I think, very often. And we should be investing more in creating the right environment, right with who we have and and who we are right now. I mean, I always love a good flip of perspective, so (laughs) this included, (laughs) but uh, I think you're so right. I hadn't thought about it or put it that way myself, but I really, really like that thought because I think where, where I sometimes get stuck is that diversity is a very shallow metric. That's just the makeup, actually. It's nothing more than that. Mm -hmm. When we get stuck only focusing on the makeup of what things look like, but as you say, we're not able to actually harbor it or hold space for it, then... It's a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe for disaster. I know I have a very dear friend who is Black, and she is very gifted and talented and does a lot of, of good things. And she's very often invited to places to share her success story, but not her skills. And her skills are amazing. And as much as I love her success story and I honor her for sharing it, and it's very inspiring to certain people, I also think that for me, that's exactly the thing when she's always the token person. Yes. And she never gets to be asked from the place of competence. She always gets to be asked from the place of having had a certain experience as a black person in a predominantly white society. And I remember I I looked at this digital conference with her and I was infuriated. I sent her a message that, how are you feeling? This must be so frustrating. This is the 10th time I see you tell the same story, do the same thing. And so that's why I really like what you're saying about what does inclusive actually look like with our actions? And how does it mean that we get to meet people in different scenarios? in our workplaces, in ideating together, in creating something together, in sharing a coffee, whatever. What does that look like? And how do we come better at being curious in those moments instead of maybe scared or reserved or whatever other feeling might come up for people? I, I, I don't know. I, I won't pretend that I do. So I really like your, your twist on that. Start with being able to actually 
use what is already there. Absolutely. And I so appreciate the story of your friend that you brought in because that's actually something that I think we should all be aware of. Tokenism is infuriating to people who have historically been underrepresented. I remember a conversation that I had with a friend of mine who's a queer woman in tech. She says, if someone asks me again, what it's like to be a queer woman in tech, (laughs) I will kill them. I will murder this person. It's insulting. Mm. It really is because you have this incredibly brilliant person, an engineer who creates these sophisticated systems and you never reach out to her to talk about, you know, how to be a great leader in a tech company or how, you know, how have you built this amazing scale up? And the only requests that she's had for years to speak were a queer woman in tech. What is, what is it like? <laughs> and tell us your story. And I think we forget, number one, it can be insulting. Number two, people are getting exhausted by telling these stories. It can be quite taxing, especially if your story has been full of hardship and exclusion, and you have to retell it over and over and over and over and over again. So I think it's such a great point, Shani. Thank you for flagging it. That we really need to be very, very sensitive around what we even ask of people in our attempts to create, you know, more inclusive environments. Because very often we're do- doing just the opposite of it. Unwittingly, of course, it's not, it's not intended, but I think here comes the point around how do we even know, right? How do we even know what's, what's okay to do and what's not okay to do? I mean, I've had that conversation with a lot of people and I think we kind of forget that it's okay to have conversations about being uncomfortable. It's okay to say that you don't know what to do. It's okay to say, I've never been in this scenario before and what would good look like for us in this? And we're so supposed to always have answers and we're supposed to always be super confident and we're supposed to always walk the straight line and be in control and maybe we get to explore together instead and sometimes nobody has the answers and you get to create something together instead but I think yeah to your point is this immediately when you said what it's like to be a queer woman in tech I remember this this meme that I saw a while back where somebody said, I'm doing this research with a man in science and I'm going to ask him, what is it like to be a man in right? science? Yeah. And, and, I, and I laughed so much because I thought, nobody ever asked that. Do you really think it's okay? Why? Because you're somehow underrepresented that it has anything to do with anything? It might have, but that's their story to tell. Yeah, totally. And so... I think this point around having conversations, it's such an important one because as you say, you know, we don't know everything. We don't have all the answers. So let's stop pretending. And also let's stop putting labels on ourselves generally and starting with us. There's, I forget the name of the author and we're going to put her name and her book in the show notes, but there's a book that talks about this concept of being goodish. And thinking of ourselves as goodish rather than being a good person. Because I think especially in this conversation around DEI, a lot of times, A, as you said, we expect that we will have all the answers. And if we don't, we are coming to the situation from a place of shame rather than curiosity. And B, it's an identity issue, I think. We want to think of ourselves as not racist, right? And as good people. And so we assume that because we're a good person, of course, as a good person, we know what to do and how to behave. And that's a total misconception. And so the author of the book talks about, it's better to think about yourself, not as good, but as goodish. So, you know, someone who, yes, has good intentions, but they don't know everything and they can, they can certainly improve. They approach these situations with a healthy amount of curiosity and humility. What do you think about that? I like that. A while back, you said something that resonated with me when we spoke. Sometimes you have to lower the bar for yourself. Mm -hmm. And it sounds so counterintuitive in a society where you're constantly raising the bar on everything. 
But lowering the bar in terms of exactly what you're saying, that it's okay not to know. It's even okay to have prejudice, biases. We all do. It's, there's no other way for our brain to make any sense of this world. And it's okay. For me, I always like to think of it also as, how do I meet the human? Not any of the labels I'm seeing, not any of the externals. How do I approach this conversation, this situation, meeting the human that I have in front of me with their potential from their perspective and also allow them to tell the story of who they are and what labels they, they choose for themselves? Sometimes it's just even a way to go, oh, I have these ideas that might actually just be a trigger for my questions. Instead, you can also flip your biases around and, and get curious about them. So yeah, I, I like that. I like the goodish also because we we need to let go of the perfection in, in these meeting each other as humans, I think, is also daring to come as you're saying, not from a place of shame, but from a place of humility also, in addition to the curiosity. Yeah. And intention, I think. It's about intention as well. I've heard that in a few conversations that I've had. If you're also willing to frame, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm asking this from this place because I would like to, for us to achieve this together. Then there is space to talk and there is space to even meet all of whatever prejudices are on the table and maybe even laugh at them. And, and people make fun of themselves too. But yeah, I like that. I like goodish. We need to lower the bar. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And also, you you know, like in terms of thinking what our processes are, right? And how we do things. And this is such a such a relevant thing in this conversation about culture generally. But I think companies, especially successful ones, they take pride in how they do things and in their culture and in their processes and in in generally how they go about things. And again, lowering the bar and thinking about what you are currently doing as, you know, maybe some of those things, yes, we can be proud of, but probably some of them could be better. And then thinking, you know, how are we making decisions? And is it possible that our decision-making process might not be as bias-free as we think? And how could we create better systems? Like, you know, one thing that is being discussed I think very often in this conversation is how do we hire, right? And what can we see? What information do we get? Or our hiring managers, when we receive a CV, for example, do we see the name? Do we see the race? Do we see the age of the candidate? And should we? And I think it's a really interesting conversation, right? Should we really? Is it so incredibly important to know what's the origin of the person, where they come from, what the race is, whether they're married or not, or even what age they are? Is it really so incredibly necessary for you to be able to identify the best candidate at, at the screening stage of the hiring process? I don't know. As a, you know, as, as someone who's running a business myself, I honestly can't see, think of very serious reasons to have this information as we are screening CVs. Can you? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> I follow a lot of really diverse people and people who talk about everything from race to gender to age. The more I listen, the more I think, what does a process look like that allows us to understand people's potential and people's abilities? in the best possible way and does that include then looking at labels that have absolutely nothing to do with it yeah and th th there's been i mean there's been research done around this where it's clear that women if you have a female name certainly women of color even worse you just change the name and change the race and suddenly this candidate gets um, their cv gets picked up uh, way more frequently. And so I think we need to think about what do our systems look at and how do we make these decisions and maybe try to weed out some of the patterns of bias that we're noticing. But back to your point, in order to be able to do that, we need to lower the bar 
stop pretending that we are, you know, best in class when it comes to DEI policies, right? I hear so many organizations that we work with or potential clients or just organizations out there use this term and it makes me laugh (laughs) (laughs) because what I mean what does it even mean and how can you honestly say that when we have so much work to do in this space I think we can all agree that we are so far away from equitable workplace very very far away from it but then that really makes me curious to dig in though What would that look like on a daily basis, do you think? Oh, that's such a great question because, I mean, one thing is it's a project and we're going to look at our processes and systems and whatnot and redesign them to make sure that there is, there is less room for bias. But then you have like these acts of daily inclusivity that basically need to happen between people as they interact with each other or as a part of the working day. And I feel this is a great opportunity for everyone to have a positive contribution. This is the first thing that I want to say that you might feel like you have very little impact over how your company hires, especially if you work in a large multinational. It can be tough, but you can certainly have an impact on your little pocket of the world and how you interact with others and the space that you create. So I think for me, those daily, uh, the daily inclusivity offers wonderful opportunities for everyone. And I think one of them is being a good ally and being an advocate for people who are not being included or not treated equitably and, you know, standing up for them and voicing your concerns. For example, you know, when someone makes a comment that is insensitive or exclusive and you don't react to that in any way. You are complicit in creating that non-inclusive environment and you can do stuff. You can do a lot actually to make sure that it doesn't happen again. You can address it on the spot in front of everyone. That probably requires a lot of courage from people, but you can also approach the person the perpetrator privately and say, hey, you know, that thing that you said to Shani about uh, people from, I don't know, Israel, that was actually (laughs) quite insensitive or to Aga about women from Eastern Europe. And how do you think she felt when she heard that? And in my experience, when you have these conversations with people they are genuinely shocked because they did it. It wasn't intentional. I do believe that most people are goodish, so they have good intentions and they say things without thinking. If you approach them and help them be aware, they will do better next time. So that's one thing that you can do. The second thing that you can do is you can go to Shani or to Aga and you say, hey, I was there. I noticed that comment. I didn't speak up in the moment. If you feel like saying, sorry, maybe I should have, then say it, but also say that wasn't cool. And I, how did that make you feel? Because if we talk about those things, I think it makes people feel seen. And and feeling seen is the first step towards feeling included and a sense of belonging. These are small acts of inclusion that, that everyone can participate in. And then of course, you know, there's creating spaces for open dialogue where people can share their experiences and perspectives, ERGs, employee resource groups, where people of various interests or communities can meet and discuss. Even small things like celebrating diverse holidays and traditions. If you know that you have culturally diverse team, policies, small policies that are so easy to implement, like swapping holidays. You know, if you are not Christian, then why on earth should you be forced to take days off over Christmas, right? And it's easy to do. Sometimes you don't even have to have a lot of formal power to suggest something like that and and see it get implemented. So these these are just off the top of my head. What are your thoughts, Shani, on this? How 
how do we foster the daily inclusivity? I'm just even thinking about back on our conversation to this point. And I think a lot of conversations that we've had, which are always at the balancing point between the individual's effort and the organizational structure and support and whatever is needed to kind of encourage different things. And I think one thing maybe to add to what you're saying is, and just what I kept hearing in our theme is that we often fail to actually translate what is an inclusive behavior look like. And that doesn't mean everyone is to execute it the exact same way. We don't need a script of phrases. We need confidence to play with what curiosity looked like, what what vulnerability looks like, what being insecure in a situation comfortably and or or even being uncomfortable in, in a way that can be constructive can look like. And I, I do think that Translating that into a structural thing is much more possible today than it has been previously. There are a lot of solutions, for example, on nudging that are scientifically based that will help people in a much more kind of regular daily way with reflection, with questions, with little nudges on the daily to to match up the policy end with actually like mindset and capabilities that are corresponding and also that's not to say because i'm also not a fan of streamlining people into a tiny pipeline and making everyone do the same thing that's also terrible so i'm more saying this and like be an exploration how you can actually maybe break it down to as you are doing behaviors and how you can support those behaviors with more inspiration as well from the company side and have more dialogues, not just about the diversity itself, but about the behaviors that are the building stones of inclusion. And those might be different in different organizations. So I think there's a lot of dialogue, but also just a little bit more granularity in a way, because I think we, we missed the point there. We're like, well, be inclusive. Yeah. And what does that mean? Totally. What does it look like to be inclusive? <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, values. Some companies have values like respect or teamwork. And you ask 10 people how they interpret it and you get 12 different answers. So I think it's really important that you kind of align, but also you help people process that and come up with that. And I would, um, pick up on that and say, what a wonderful idea to help your teams and your employees to contribute to that granularity and say, you know, from my perspective, this is what an inclusive behavior looks like. Because that's actually inclusion in action. You are not translating it for people, you are doing it with them. And that's a nuance that very often gets lost in this conversation. We're thinking, right, so how can we give people the nudges? How can we tell people what to do? How can we give these guardrails? And I think it's about how can we co-create those with our people so that it makes sense, as you say, to everyone in our organization, because what Inclusion looks like in Netflix or, I don't know, in, in Unilever, it's probably going to be different in terms of those granular daily behaviors. And I, I would even dare to say that what inclusion and inclusive behaviors look like in the accounting department of Netflix is probably going to be different to the marketing department and even smaller groups within them because they are simply, they consist of different individuals. Yeah, I'd add, engage and involve your people in the process of decoding what that really looks like and creating that granularity. I love that. Co-creation, I think, is such a magic word. I think it forces us to do one more thing in, in space of work, which is stop infantilizing people. Mm. We create <laughs> so many structures that treat adult people like less than children. And, and we give it up. We give the power up. We give the power of thought up and we just sit down and wait for somebody to think for us. And I think the reality is also, and what came up for me as I was listening to you is if we really want to be inclusive, we have to show up as ourselves, as full adults, take responsibility, 
co-create. Nobody's going to do it for you. N- not a single policy. Nothing. It's all on, on us at the end of the day. And so I'm like, yeah, co-creation. But then there has to be a letting go from the, from the company side as well of saying, you get to explore this. We help you <laughs> with maybe some basic formats, some discussion, some questions, some, some liberty, some mandate to do something different. But yeah, co-creation for me is, is a magic word in any context. Yeah, I, I so agree. I mean, I'm a huge proponent of this as well. And, you know, it's not an either or proposition, right? So it doesn't mean that you will not provide some guidelines to your employees, as you say, because obviously I'm sure that your DI lead and, and the DI team have a lot of great ideas on how to do that. And they should be included in the process as well. And their knowledge and expertise absolutely needs to be capitalized on. But your employees, as you say, are a bunch of talented grown-ups, and I'm sure that they have a lot to contribute to that too. That's awesome. Shani, I, I wonder, I know that a lot of people, especially in the space of DI and HR, will also want us to touch upon, right, so yeah, okay, I have a roadmap. We're going to run some initiatives. We're going to engage our people. We will review our systems and processes to really get some traction here and make genuine impact. But how do we know that it's even working? And I think that's a big question that a lot of people in the space have. It's a new field. There is no map, I think, of the territory necessarily. And so there is a lot of insecurity around, is what we're doing even working? Do you have any examples or thoughts around how do we measure? How do we measure the impact of DEI initiatives in our company and potentially even the dreaded, you know, ROI of DEI? Although I do get a little bit of allergic reaction when I hear this because <laughs> I think we should we should be beyond the point of trying to prove that there is return on investment. Uh, but anyway, if you need to, if you are in an organization that is asking you to do that, do you have any thoughts on what would be good measures or good way of kind of getting the pulse of the organization as to the effectiveness of what you're doing? I love the question. And I'm also admittedly a little bit intimidated by it because I know that there are a lot of charters and a lot of different groups who dig into this in great detail. So I will, I will answer this with all of my humility and, uh, and grace and knowing that, you know, this is not my, my biggest area of expertise by any means. I'll answer maybe just from my lens of working with, with experience design, of working with creating culture. You know, of course, there are all of the of the makeup metrics. And that might be good to know. And I I won't put any value into that because I I don't I don't know enough. But but I do think that as with any experience, it becomes really important to understand what impact you're looking to see and can be on different levels. So not just you know, how many people got promoted, but other things that are actually playing into th- the previous question that we had, what does inclusivity look like on a daily basis? And are we experiencing those behaviors or those moments to a greater extent? Because at the end of the day, I think it's a lot like I worked in learning before. How do you measure the impact of learning? Does it matter that you took an unconscious bias course if you're not actually using your awareness of unconscious bias? No, like this is the thing that we would want to look at. In my world is is that is how many more people are actually feeling included for whatever reason they might not have been feeling it before. And what does the work environment actually look like? And to me, that takes a starting point in in actually having that co-creation and that dialogue at the outset. In addition to all the other beautiful metrics that I'm sure exist and and I'm sure there are plenty uh, on a very kind of researched and scientific level. But on a principle level, I think it's that is is also daring to look at what is the impact you want to generate 
specifically in your organization in regards to this? Because the reality is organizations will look different from continent to continent, from country to country. There will be different questions of the heart for different types of people. There will be different types of of setup of diversity in terms of religion and race and genders and and whatever other factors they will be. So I I do always also encourage to make it yours beyond the standard things. I think it's so important. Thanks for sharing this, Shani. And you know, so basically what I what I hear you say is sure use, you know, some demographic data, pay equity audits, all that stuff that is quantitative. And it might give you some valuable information, but don't only limit yourself to that. It's really important to make sure that you you have some qualitative metrics as well. As you say, that looks at, for example, those behaviors that we consider to be inclusive behaviors, or what does equity look like? And do people feel like it's a fair and equitable environment? And again, what does fairness and equity look like and whether we see these practices being implemented in our organization. So it's about translating these words into something that can be measured and then getting the pulse and asking people whether they see those things being implemented. And I love that because I think, you know, when you only look at the qualitative stuff, as you say, you know, in every country it will look different. It can feel quite forced, of course, when you are trying to get an even kind of spread or set only these kind of goals. And I also feel like it takes time for numbers to reflect certain things. And so having these qualitative measures are really making a statement, which is we trust in the process. We we know what the process is. We don't know necessarily where it's going to get us because there is no one size fits all when it comes to companies in various geographies and so on. But we're confident that the process that we have in place is a fair and equitable one and that we are really paying attention to what matters, which are those practices, processes, <laughs> and behaviors linked to DEI. I really think it's important. And as you say, you know, there are so many tools out there. We will post some of the links to some of the tools, but I'd encourage everyone who listens to it to do your own research, think about it, create a nice suite for your organization that you can work with. And again, uh, based on what we have said at the beginning, perfection is not the goal. So it's not like we will try to get everything right. You have to find the ways of measuring and demonstrating impact that work for your organization. Yeah, I think so. But then this can still be stretched for a lot of organizations. As you were talking about this, like it's a lot of things to move into. It might be a change in behavior for people, a change in types of interactions, ways of working, and likelihood that people will resist that and not not desire that change is is quite big like how do you think that we move past that as organizations and how do we include people in that process in my mind a big part of resistance is linked to what i what we talked about at the beginning of our conversation which is as long as people feel like these changes are going to take something away from them they will resist because none of us likes losing something, right? And this is how our brains are wired. We are biased towards avoiding loss rather than gaining something. So for me, what's really important when we think about how do we even approach resistance to a different way of working is thinking, how can we reframe it so that people see that it's not, no one is going to lose anything. It's again, back to the phrase that Minda shared with me, how can we expand the table or enlarge the pie so that everyone gets more value? Because if you say only one group is going to get more value and others feel, oh, so I will lose something here now, that's 
obviously a human reaction is, I really don't want that. Now, how do you do that? It's a long conversation and we have too little time probably to really, to really do it justice. I'm not going to get into that. How do you do that? How do you show people that you can really grow the pie instead of just uh, creating uh, different slices? That's for me one thing. Second thing, and I know, Shani, that I use this phrase in one of our conversations. Someone said it, I have no idea who, attribution is impossible, I think in this case, but someone said something that stuck with me, which is understanding is just a different way to call love. And love is a dirty word in the workplace, as we know, (laughs) and we hate it. It makes us feel uncomfortable. But nevertheless, here I said it. And I really think that another way of overcoming resistance specifically around diversity, equity, and inclusion is helping people understand each other's experiences. Because once we understand, fully understand, I think human reaction, unless you are a sociopath, is wanting to make it right. If we don't understand, then we don't have a gateway, I suppose, to tap into our innate humanity. And, you know, humans are wired to, to be fair. That they've, there have been experiments, we feel uncomfortable. And even with kids, you know, especially with kids, I think kids feel uncomfortable. They hate getting preferential treatment. And so it's in human nature. We should give ourselves a little bit more credit about, you know, who we are and what we're capable of. So that would be my second thought. Just think about how you can create more understanding for uh, and between different groups. Because really, when people feel like they are part of an opposing camp, it's not going to work. No. I think that was exactly where my thought starts with you're saying opposing camp. And what I would add to what you're saying is not to get stuck in this painting of reality in which there, there will be unfairness portrayed and there will be experiences that are difficult to share and difficult to receive. And that is a necessary step. And in that step, we don't create anything. That's the step where we're sharing, we're grounding, we're seeing each other. And so I would also add to that, making sure that there is a joint movement towards whatever new states that wants to be created, because it's very, very easy to stay in the blame and the frame and who's here and what's this position and for all sides to get stuck in that and and feel like it's unfair or or it from different perspectives it's very important to paint reality and for everyone to get to share their piece if they want and it's equally important to dare to start sharing and moving a vision i know that eva humboldt i interviewed on on my podcast and i've mentioned her before here as well she always said yeah i realized that you can't just revolutionize against something you also have to revolutionize <laughs> towards something and so I think it's very important to know, yeah, what, what is it that you want to eliminate, but equally make sure you're moving into that vision and that co-creation together and, and away from only this like a problematic framing of reality. But have that. That's your baseline. That's not something to ignore. That's something to, to come back to and, and, and kind of see, see where your growth is taking you. Um, but also don't get stuck there. Oh, yes. So... This is such an important point that really, absolutely, you cannot revolutionize against something. I had Greg Sattel, the author of Cascades on how to create a movement. And that was one of the principles actually that he mentioned because he studied successful and unsuccessful movements. And all the unsuccessful movements had one thing in common, and it was trying to tear down the status quo without having a compelling vision of what the alternative looks like. So really powerful movements where there is a lot of anger and frustration with status quo, they never take off if you don't have that vision of what better looks like. And I also love what you were saying here about, you know, just listening to each other. And I think it's back to our conversation about lowering the bar again, right? Don't expect that it's going to be easy. 
Don't expect that it's going to be pleasant. Expect to feel awkward and uncomfortable in this conversation. And that's why we're doing it. We're doing it to understand, to listen to each other. And and it's not going to be probably a fuzzy, you know, warm feeling that you might get in other situations. And that's okay. Yeah. And life is a little bit awkward. <laughs> just <Big time>. is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yes, it really is. Okay. So being mindful of time, let's have a peek into the future and then we'll wrap it up and share our takeaways, what stuck with us from this conversation. Do you think that this conversation is going to shift? What is the future of organizations when it comes to uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and perhaps even belonging, which is the fourth element very often that is added to that acronym? DEIB. What's the future of DEIB, Shani? No, I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> Let me look into my crystal ball. I'm just going to take my tarot cards out and we'll see where we end up. I'm very much a person who revolutionizes towards the need to really profoundly redesign the way that we do work. So, my hope for this is that. That, that is part of that package that we need to really dare to uproot a lot of the ideas that, you know, our work environments are based on. And do I think this is a quick process? Absolutely not. <laughs> but I think there's an opportunity in a lot of these areas which are already being questioned and already being discussed to actually provoke and, and stimulate more more change. So I would hope, my hope for it is that what is the future? I mean, that's whatever we create. So I'll continue revolutionizing towards something much more human. And my hope would be that we in our workplaces really get better at meeting, seeing, and approaching our humanness. And I think it goes into a discussion we had in a previous episode around not being fixated on this professional suit of ours anymore, but rather how do we actually put to play all of the potential that we have in different ways? So yeah, my hope would be that this, this question also serves towards that uh, and that we can leverage that in a positive way. Yeah, totally. And I hear you when you say and emphasize this word hope. I think this is, you know, there is an army of people out there who, who hope for that future. This, this is why we do what we do. And I think our hope combined with informed action can really make a difference. So just to add to what you have just said, I know that there are a lot of people out there in the trenches doing this incredibly important work. I want to believe in the future that I want to see is one where their work starts paying off and we are seeing an environment where we have less polarization. Because frankly, I think that we are at a fork in the road. We live in such a polarized world and clearly that polarization is very visible in the workplace as well. So things can either go very wrong, very, very wrong, or, as you say, we will finally realize that at the end of the day, we're all human and we start seeing that humanity in each other and things start going in the right direction where people can really show up authentically in the workplace and are valued for what they have to bring, which is not just the skills, but also their unique personality and take on things without the bias. So that's, I have the same hope. <laughs> and, mm. and it's fueled by really so many people doing great work in the space. So Shani, time for our takeaways. What stuck with you? Ooh. <laughs> Not so much is in my head right now. I think this conversation re-emphasized for me how much we really need to be better at harboring differences 
And I think actually now that you brought up polarization, it just like pushed a little button in me that that's the question I've been asking myself for a long time is how do we make it possible for people to meet and not have the objective of necessarily even agreeing and not having to maybe even have an opinion and not having to pick a camp? How do we build organizations that know how to deal with the gray zone? What does it look like when I act out being in that space that we said? It's a bit awkward. It's a bit uncomfortable. It might not resolve anything, but it's still going to be a conversation. So I think this conversation for me emphasized the need of being able to deal with the gray zones and the differences and not try to like pick a camp, streamline anything. It's not about that because inclusion is not about making everybody the same. Inclusion is about making space for everyone. And so whether it's something that you can see externally or or it's something that is lived internally, what does that look like? I think was a question that popped back up and I'm taking it with me again. For me, when I think of my key takeaway, this is actually something that we discussed even before we start recording where you said, hey, you know, I really feel intimidated by this topic. And I said, me too. (laughs) Oh my God, this is super scary because none of us feels um, like an expert in the space. And it's definitely a very sensitive topic and we both realize that. And it's really hit me that if we feel this way, other people feel this way as well. And maybe even with more intensity, because I think for us, you know, the space of culture shaping culture or employee experiences, it's our home. For others, it's not. And so specifically this topic, it must feel incredibly uncomfortable. And so my takeaway is that perhaps part of this work for the people who are passionate about creating equitable organizations is how can we make people feel a little bit more comfortable in this conversation? Because our human nature is to avoid stuff that is super uncomfortable. We hide, we (laughs) find excuses. We say, you know, the dog ate my homework. I cannot uh, participate. There's something about making it easier. Because we know from behavioral science that when things are easier, we are more likely to engage. And I know that it's perhaps slightly contradictory to something that I agree with, that you said that it is going to be uncomfortable <laughs> and, we, and we should lower the bar and not expect that it's going to be warm and fuzzy. So it's kind of a conundrum in my mind. I don't have an easy answer. I don't. But it just struck me as something important. If only we could make it slightly easier for people, then I think we would have better progress here. So for our listeners, whoever is listening to that, if you have any ideas for me, I would be grateful. Hit me up on LinkedIn (laughs) and let me know. My immediate thought is also that sometimes when we talk about easier, we think we need to remove discomfort or remove fear. But maybe that isn't easier. The easier thing is how do we make it easier to move with it or through it, not remove it? At least that's sometimes where I get stuck in life and in work in general. We we get so fixated on simplifying by completely removing, but actually the simplifying might just be a sense of comfort and support instead. So yeah, I'll throw that in as a yeah. <laughs> as a bonus. Thank you. But uh, equally, I am very curious, and I would love to hear what comes up for for other people as well. Amazing! All the stuff that we talked about in terms of links, uh, you will be able to find it in the show notes. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being with us. And yeah, we'll speak to you next month. Looking forward, as usual. I'm Aga Bayer, the creator and host of the Culture Lab podcast. And this is the Culture Lab team. Anis and Labarawi, production manager. Sound producer, Heather McPherson, Twisted Spur Media.
I hope that you enjoyed this monthly format where Shani and I discuss all things culture. And if you found this conversation interesting or inspiring or valuable, and chances are that you did since you are still listening here, you'll also love the conversation that I recently had with Minda Hartz. You'll find the link in the show notes. And if you haven't already done so, please go ahead and follow the Culture Lab podcast in your favorite listening app. And please do me a solid and share it, maybe on social or by text or by email, even just with one person. Just copy the link from the app that you are using and tell your friends who want to find new, better ways of cultivating a great company culture. Tell them to listen and then chat about what you've both discovered. Because when shows like this become conversations and conversations become action, that's how we transform the workplace culture. And if you want to dive even deeper into the topic and find like-minded peers who are in charge of culture work in the organization, you might consider joining Culture Brains. It's our one-of-a-kind culture accelerator program and a global community of peers that is truly shaping the future of work. You can learn more at tinyurl.com forward slash culture You'll find the link in the show notes. Thanks again for tuning in. If you want to get free resources on cultivating a remarkable, powerful, and authentic company culture, especially in a business that scales, type this into your browser. agabayer.com forward slash resources. If you haven't subscribed to the Culture Lab yet, please do it now. That's the best way you can support our work. And finally, We would be ever so grateful if you could rate and review our podcast on the platform that you listen to. Thank you. And you are amazing for listening to this point. Not many people do.